I want you to know that my evolution in this work has been that I am a soulful entrepreneur. And what I've been getting in the last 10 years of doing this work is that a soulful entrepreneur is different than an entrepreneur at some level because what we know is that our love and our life and our work and our spirituality are not separate. Now think about that. They're not separate. They're all one. And I think that that's the distinction that we really get that it's about co-creating our higher self with our higher power and learning how to do this so we can be the gift that we were put on this earth to be. Gifts are to be given, not withheld. And we need to get that it's all one. And I feel like and when I get into this talk more, you're going to really get clear on what this really means about being a soulful entrepreneur. How many of you are running a business right now by a raise of hands? How many of you want to run a business by a raise of hands and become an entrepreneur? Okay. What I want to tell you is that, and I'm not trying to put down it, but it's a lot of work. It is probably more work than you'll ever do in your entire life, but it's the most rewarding thing you could possibly do because you're doing something from a soul level. And tonight, I'm going to be teaching you the things I've learned in the journey that I've been on and help you hopefully walk away with value tonight where you can do the same thing. So the first thing is, is that I want you to know is that a soulful entrepreneur understands that there are three types of businesses. There are undersized businesses, there are right-sized businesses, and there are oversized businesses. And let me talk to you about what that means. When you're stepping into your business, just like I began Seattle Life Coach Training, I had to humble myself from this room, literally, to an attic in Green Lake of a woman's home that I begged her to let me do a class. The room, it was so short, it was an old house, it was like this, and the roof was like this, and at the time I had a faux hawk, and my hair would hit the top of the roof. You had to climb a ladder to get there, and I walked up there, then before the class began, I'm like, people aren't gonna wanna stay. Like, they're gonna say, what? You want me to climb that ladder and go where? But I couldn't afford a bigger space. I, she told me, just pay me whatever you can pay me. And I had to trust that the people that signed up and paid money were going to not walk out when I asked them to climb a ladder. <laughs> and we did that for probably a good year in this space. And then I had to move into a larger space. And I kept evolving it and evolving it. And one of the things I've never done is I never went too big until it was time. Because here's what I'm going to say to you. Hear this. This is my highest advice for you tonight as you're building a business. Don't go out and rent a space that's too big for you and too much money because you're going to be paying your profits to a landlord. You need to figure out what's the right size for your company and eventually you're going to grow into it because otherwise you can't make the money you need. You're paying someone else. And I've seen this, at this for the Sweeha students and my Seattle students where they all are like, I'm going to quit my job right after graduation and I'm going to rent this 3,000 square foot space and I'm going to have a healing center and that's a great vision. Vision it. Hold the, hold the vision. Trust the process. But we don't go out and do that. So what I say to the students is, here's what you do. You rent a space. So Michael rents a space with Rick, and you guys share a space on Mondays. You do 9 to 1, and you do from 2 to 6. When you can fill up your 9 to 1, and he can fill up his 2 to 6, then do another day, and then do another day, and then continue to evolve it. But don't go out because I've seen it fail way too many times. It's not realistic, and you have to prime the pump to get you where you need to go. That's the big piece. The second thing a soulful entrepreneur needs to know, and they understand, that there are two types of help. There is human help and divine help. But think about what I just said to you. You can't do this alone. No one can do it alone. And when you think you can do it alone, 
You're wandering aimlessly in your own meager will, and you're not asking for help. One of the reasons I've gotten to where I'm at is because I'm really good at asking for what I need and being realistic about that. So there are human beings that can support you in your journey of being an entrepreneur. And there are also your higher power, which I think is another massive piece to this process, that we've got to go to take it to God. We've got to learn how to co-create. We've got to learn how to get up there and ask for what we need and know that it's not always in your timing. It's, there's divine timing and there's also your timing. And I promise you, divine timing will win out every time. So we got to get that it's really important for you to get that there are two types of help. And it comes from spiritual liability in my book where I talk specifically about this subject. So I want to walk you through now the seven success keys to running a soulful business. And you may want to take some notes. Because what it's going to help you do is get really clear on the seven things that I've learned that I would rather that you have this escalate you and up-level you and not make the mistakes that possibly you could or that I've even made in my work as I journey into my success of being a business soulful entrepreneur. So I want to tell you about these seven sex success keys before you step into this. So I knew I was doing this talk probably like eight months ago because we scheduled these out and I had no idea what I was going to talk about. Not a clue. I just said yes to a date, which is how I operate. And I was probably two months ago, had no clue what I was going to talk about. No clue. Zero. I told my partner, I'm like, I don't even know what I'm talking about. He's like, well, you better hurry up and get rolling because it's coming. And I sat down in my bed one morning, and all of a sudden, I heard it. It was a download. And I heard Spirit say, go get your tablet because this is going to be quick. <laughs> and that's how it works for me. And I got the biggest tablet I could get, and I got the best pen with all the ink, and my hand just started flowing. And I mean, it was like a download that I have had when I've written every one of my books. When I write my books, they're all downloaded by Spirit, every single one of them. The only thing I take credit for is doing the work. The rest of it is not me. It's spirit moving through me, and I do the work. So it's the same process. So I'm here, and I'm just writing. And my hand, I mean, there was like smoke coming off that page. I had no idea what I was writing. When I was done, I collapsed and took a nap. And then I woke up and thought, man, this is some good stuff. <laughs> like, where did this come from? So what I'm trying to tell you is that this is spirit-guided. That's why we are a spirit-directed college. And that's what we teach you here, is to help you understand that spirit is going to direct you if you get out of its way. Did you hear me? Get out of its way. It, which is whatever you call it. And it's not up in your head. We've got to learn how to let it flow through us and be a conduit. So here we go. Are you ready for the download? Number one, you need to become an expert in something. Now, this scares people because people say, I have no idea. Because the word expert is intimidating, isn't it? Like, an expert? Me? I'm an expert? Yes. There's something that God, universe, spirit, put inside of you, and you just need to get quiet enough to figure it out and let it come through you and guide you. So what I say here is we've got to learn how to discover our niche. We have to master our message and show up and be courageous. So the part is, is that I remember many years ago when I worked at admissions here at Sweeha, and there was a kid that came into my office who was also in my classes, and he came to me for a session. And he said, I am going to charge $500 a session. I said, well, what qualifies you to charge $500 and that someone's going to pay you for that? I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying what qualifies you? Well, my name is John. And he used his last name, but I'm not going to use. So, and I said, well, what, is, what makes you an expert? He's like, well, I'm John. And what makes you an expert? What is it you're selling? What is your product? What is your message? I don't know, but I'm John. I mean, look at me. I'm amazing. 
And I thought, okay, I'm not going to down or dim him down, but we're going to have a little reality check here because if you're going to charge $500 a session, I would hope that you have a message. You have a product, which we're going to talk about. So the, the piece here is that we've got to find a niche. And, and the thing that I would tell you is that how I've learned my niche is that that thing that you do when you don't look at the clock which I call bliss. So when you want to ask yourself where does time, where your bliss is, ask yourself where time doesn't exist. That's where your niche is at. That thing that you love to do and you do it for free all the time because it's your niche. It's your expertise. It is your gift. God put it in you for a reason. So you got to cultivate it. You can't just sit back and I say this, what good is an instrument that hides in its case? Worthless. A lot of you have amazing gifts, and you've been giving these gifts, but a lot of you put them on the shelf, you put them under the bed, and a clarinet under the bed is useless. We've got to take it out, dust it off, and utilize it. So our work is to master our message, figure out what our niche is, but the piece is we've got to show up and be courageous. That's the part that a lot of the students get to. They're like, ah, uh, are they going to like me? Ah, uh, am I going to be good at it? Ah, uh, is it going to show up? And I'm sure the racket goes on and on. Like I told you in Seattle, it took me six months to sell six seats, and I gave away four <laughs> to fill the room. And I was scared to death, shaking in my boots, that they weren't going to show up or they were going to climb the ladder. And you would, and my business is making six figures now. Number two, we need to learn to co-create with our higher power. We need to learn how to commune with our higher power. And we need to learn how to then listen to what our higher power is telling us and then go do it. The piece to this is that what I'm going to tell you is that my higher power is my employer. In Spiritual Reliability, my second book, I say, if God was an employer, would you be hired? And your higher power hires those that are reliable the ones that will do the work. So if you are, if God is your employer and he comes or it comes or she comes or whatever you define it as comes and says, here, I have a job for you. Now go do it. And you don't do it and you stand back and say, no, not today. Today I'm, I'm, I'm depressed. Today I'm tired. I'll do it tomorrow. How long do you think you're going to keep getting these opportunities? Not a long time because eventually it's going to stop because the universe goes, well, I can't, you're not ready yet, so I'm going to just wait until you are, and it moves on to the next person. So we've got to understand that we have to co-create. And when you start co-creating your business with your higher power, it gets flawless. Because think about what's happening. This pure energy higher power, God, universe, spirit that knows all, sees all, is guiding you into something amazing. Think about that. It's graceful. It's easy, but it's hard work, guys. Because I'm going to tell you something about God as my employer. It's very demanding. <laughs> it's demanding. Four o'clock in the morning, I get wake-up calls all. When I was writing both my books, four o'clock in the morning, every night. Good morning. Hey, it's four o'clock. I'm supposed to be sleeping. Nope. You know that download I just gave you in your dream? Get up. Get on your computer, knock it out, and go back to bed. And then you're going to refine it for the rest of the day. That's what my life has been like all the time. So when I get woke up at 4 a.m., that's spirit calling. Listen to it. That's communion. That's co-creating. The universe is always guiding you if you just listen. How many of you hear spirit at 4 a.m.? 3 a.m., 2 a.m.? Okay. High, 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 hot tip. Get up. Get up and do the work. 
Number three, deliver a high level product or service. Now this is a big one for me and I talk about this as spiritual liability. There's a difference between intentions. So there is intention and then there's a high level intention. So their one intention would be is I want to do something amazing in the world because I want to edify me and I want to make a lot of money and I want it to be all about me so I get what I want. That's a, fine if that's what you want, but it's a little self-ish, a little egotistical. And I'm going to say this, that we're not monks and living in a monastery. We are people that have written bills to pay, and I get it, that we need to, um, we need to monetize our skills and gifts and get paid for what we do. But there's a different way of handling this for me and what I've learned in my work and the success of my businesses. A high-level intention is one that says, how may my contribution be an up-level to the world, and how will my contribution, well, everyone wins by what I put into the, into the world. So the question I have here is that we call it right use of your gifts and talents. Now, when I was writing Spiritual Reliability, there's a word that kept coming up, and I know when I speak this word to you, you're going to get it. And the word is righteous. It's biblical. You ever heard that word? It always triggered me. And I remember when I was writing, I thought that kept, word kept coming up for me. But it was bothered me all the time. And so I started researching the word righteous. And you know what righteousness means, broken down simply? Right use. So how simple does that just give you? That must ease the pain for you. Because it's about how can I use my life in the right way? Use my gifts and talents in the right way. And so it's about using your gifts and talents in the right way. So here's the questions I would ask you to ask yourself when you're using your gifts and talents of the high level intention. Number one, does the world need it? Now, why me? I want you to sit with this. Does the world need it? Is it something that's going to be a contribution that's going to uplevel the world? The second one is, does everyone win with my contribution? Third is, will the world rise with my worldly offering? Now, these are discernment questions of how do I know that my product or service is, uh, is a high-level intention and that everyone's going to win from this. And you, can you imagine if you went into the world with a high-level intention that everybody wins when they absorb, take on, experience your product, and if we were all doing that and being our highest self and putting our products and services out there in a way that everyone wins, that gets a piece of it, the whole world would rise. And we need that more than ever right now. We need this more than ever that the whole world rises. And so some of you say, well, I'm a hairdresser. You know what? It's not about cutting their hair. It's about the conversation you're having with them. About how can I take this moment of cutting this person's hair and up-level their life, bring a piece of truth, bring a piece of light into their life and make a difference in their life? So whatever you're doing, and I got when I was waiting tables back in the 90s, this is not about me slinging pasta. This is not about me bringing another glass of wine to you. This is about me, I see you. I know who you are, and I'm going to make sure that everything I do is going to make you get that. And that's why they'd sit at the front desk and wait for my section, because they knew that when they sat down with me, that I'd see them, and I'd remember them, and I remember what they ate and drank. And that was made a difference in their life. So it's not about what you think it is. It's really about a higher level contribution. Number four. We have to have great faith and practice. Now, this is a big one. Seattle Life Coach Training, and I know Sweeha also, is a faith-based business. Now, I've told this to people at, in my work, and I had one guy say, that's crap. Okay, <laughs> tell me more, as a coach would say. 
He's like, I am, this is, I am not doing this for faith. I said, but you know what it's about? Is that you got to get that if you're co-creating your soulful business with your higher power, that there is something about having faith in something you can't see that's managing you, that's running you, that's giving you the download, that's giving you the information, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really about, you have to get that this is a faith-based business. You don't know how it's going to play out. You don't know who's going to come. You don't know who's going to show up. You don't know who's going to buy your product. But if you trust that the universe is going to bring those people to you in divine or divine timing, then it gets easy because you just let it be. I'm not saying you resign, but you definitely need to get that it's just about having faith. And I say, is my faith greater than my doubt? My faith is greater than my doubt. And sometimes my faith is not greater than my doubt. And that's the work. So what I say here is this. When we have great faith and we have great practice, I say we hold the vision and we trust the process. So what I'm saying to you is that we need to hold the vision of where I want my business to go and then trust the process. Because I'm going to tell you right now, my company has not succeeded and was never a straight shot to the goal. It was never a straight shot. It is, it's been like this the whole nine years, like this. And there's been times I wanted off the roller coaster. So I had to hold the vision that I don't, I'm not thinking I'm going where I want to go, but if I just hold that vision and trust the ride, it'll take me there. Next, we have to learn, and this is my work, not your work, but this is just a thought for you, prayer and meditation. This is a big one for me, and I want to break this down for you. The definition between the two are very different. Prayer, prayer is to learn how to ask for what you want. So prayer is to ask. You ask for something. You go to take it to your higher power and you ask for what it is that you want, that you desire. And to meditate is to listen. So to pray is to ask, to meditate is to listen. So we've got to learn that we've got to say our prayers and we have to ask our higher power for what we want, but then we have to learn how to get quiet and still so we can hear the voice. And the voice may say, no, I don't want you to do that. I need you to go that way. So what I say I hear is that we need, to tr we need to create and readjust. So we're going to create, create, and then we have to readjust because it wasn't supposed to be that way. Because again, if we do this work, the universe higher power is going to take you to a bigger dream than you could dream for yourself. And I promise you, it can see more than you can see. So trust it. The other ways that I do it, and this is interesting why I call it a faith-based business, is I call in and invoke my clients. I want to just speak this out. This is very interesting. So I use mantras, I use prayer, and I use meditation. So when I'm working with calling in a class, like right now we're enrolling for the August 25th class in Seattle, and it is a journey to get the room full. It's the game that you play, and it's the thing I like least about the work, but in the end, it's very, very amazing. But what I do is I call my students in. So I literally will sit in the middle of the room and pray them in, bring them in, invoke them in. And I say, I know that there are 37 students that are waiting for the call, meaning that the universe is going to ring, ring in their head, and they're going to find me. And I don't know when it's going to happen, but every single class for the last five years is full every single time. Because I use mantras. I have a prayer mantra that I use, and I just call them in, call them in, call them in, call them in. And it's quite a process. And my assistants and my other teachers say, how do you do this? I call them in. I invoke them. I bring them in through my prayer and my meditation. So the piece to this also is that, again, I talked about this earlier. With this process of invoking people and bringing your, your clients into you, you have to really understand that, again, there's your timing and divine timing. What I do know every single time is that every class is full. That's the vision I hold. I know, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know on that first in the class, it's going to be pinging out of the walls and we're not going to have seats. 
I love it. I love it. I look at my assistant and go, we did it again. I don't know how we did it. I had a nervous breakdown at least three times. Because <laughs> it takes money to make money. And here's the part on the very bottom. You got to do the work to stay out of fear. That all that stuff I just talked about is all the work I do. Do you understand what I mean by staying out of fear? Because when you're running a business, a soulful business or any business, honestly, you're in charge. It's on your shoulders. You have people to pay. You have rent to pay. <sighs> How am I going to do this? Tax season comes. Oh, we love tax season. And you see your bank account. That messes with your head. So what do I do? I just trust. Pay my bills. Here, IRS. Here's your $20,000. Goodbye. <laughs> and I just do my work to stay out of fear. Because that's what will derail you, is the fear that goes on inside of you that'll shut you down and stop you. And I'm going to be honest with you. This is something I was not going to plan on talking about, but I'm going to do it. It's called spiritual warfare, people. You're light workers in this room. And if you're a light worker in the room, there is another energy that would love to knock you off balance because your job is to go out there and save a few souls or a few thousand souls. And the last thing it wants is for you to succeed. So our job in this is to do the work to stay out of fear because fear will rob you. And if we all know this, it's false evidence appearing real. And when fear shows up, there's two things we can do. We can face it and rise, or we can forget it and run. And I hope that you'll rise from it and just look it right in the eye and just call it out and move right through it, whatever way that means for you. Number five, you need to learn how to lead like-minded people. This is a huge one. And what I talk about in this process is that we need to make sure that we are discerning our team, the people that are working. If you have one person, discern them. Discernment is a process of getting a feel that they're in the right flow with you, that they're in the same values as you. They are aligned with your mission statement that you have and that you're allowing your intuition to guide you. Because you all know you know that you know that you know. And when you know that you know, listen to it. My team in Seattle is so amazing and they have all are in alignment. And one of them has been with me for seven years because we're in alignment. She's in my value. And the big word in this is that you trust them that you'll trust them when you're on vacation, you'll trust them to deliver your product, you know they're in integrity, they're gonna do what you would do when you're not looking. And the same thing with Suiha. There's a reason that we don't leave. There's a reason I've been here since 2003 because every single person that I know in this place that's here is in alignment. Shelly up there, right over here, who I know that's her work. You're, it's about discernment and getting people on board and trusting the process and the mission statement, the values, and making sure. And that's why a mission statement exists. Companies that have mission statements, how many of you work for companies with mission statements by a raise of hand? Okay, that's most of you. How many of you know your mission statement? Right? Like half of you that raised your hand. That's not probably a good deal. The reason a mission statement exists is because you want to make sure you're in alignment with that mission statement. So as a soulful business owner, whoever is working with you, your team members need to know your mission statement and they're in alignment with that. So make sure that you're leading like-minded people because it's going to help you grow your business. Number six, we need to learn how to delegate to experts. Now this is a huge one. I'm going to tell you about myself. I'm a control freak. Anyone else relate to that? Yeah. Like, I'm the only one that can do it as well as I do it. I'm the only one that will deliver the product the way I would deliver it. So what I would do in the beginning of my career as a soulful entrepreneur is I was doing everything. I had a philosophy that I don't trust them. 
I don't trust him. I don't trust him. I don't trust him. And so I'd do everything. You know what was left? Nothing. I was exhausted all the time. I'd work 24 hours a day because I was the bookkeeper. I was the web designer. I was the virtual assistant. I was my marketing guy. I was the enrollment advisor. I was the content editor. I was my video production guy. I was a teacher. I was also an ambassador. I was all these things, but I couldn't be good at one thing because I was too busy doing everything that I shouldn't be doing. What my job is, is to steer the ship. So one of the things that really got me over the top of my company, where my company began to go into the six figures, was when I began to delegate. And I remember it was this weird aha, like, oh my God, you mean I've got to give somebody the job to do something that I don't trust them to do? And I heard Spirit say, yeah, <laughs> because you can't do it. You can't be an expert in everything, Richard. How egotistical is that? And you know what happened when I started delegating? My business rose. My production rose. My level of compellingness in the classroom rose because I was not exhausted. I had a team supporting me. I had somebody else doing the work, and the business began to rise from that. But you know what it comes down to? Guess what? This. You've got to pay people. And that's not always easy when you're in a budget, is it? Because how am I going to afford to pay somebody to do this work? And I'm going to say this to you right now. How can you not afford to do it? And I was doing this slide, and I looked at, and this was an aha for me. Like, I couldn't believe this is every area of my company that is currently in existence. I think there's 10 things here. And now I want to think about what I said. How could I possibly do all that? Can't. So delegate to experts. Number seven, we need to learn how to be visible and relevant. So the piece to this, I thought it was interesting, is that, you know, the world's changing. I'm going to give you an example. So when I have my people call about my training program, and I'm sure that the admissions team here at Sweeha can relate to this, getting people that inquire on your website about your product and then getting them on the phone is a whole nother conversation. I, I, it still makes me, it makes me just crazy. Because you, you went to my website, you inquired, and now I'm going to follow up, or my team follows up with you, but we can't get you to answer the phone. You won't answer the phone. You don't pick up for discovery calls. You inquired to us. I didn't reach out to you. I'm not cold calling you. You're the one that came to me. You came to my store. So, we, so I had to sit one day and I said, God, I'm co-creating my business. What do I do to get these people to answer the phone? Right? And I heard, text them. I'm like, that's so <laughs> impersonal. It's so impersonal to text people, I thought. Right? Do you get what I'm saying? Do you know what happened after we started texting people? They communicate with you. Oh my God, I got a reply. Because that's relevance. That's visibility. Because the world's changing. People are losing the art of talking on the phone. The other thing I did is I just produced a video where it's a one minute and 20 second video of doing the same thing I would do to email them. So I'm going to say, hi, welcome. Thank you for inquiring about our training program. I want you to know this is what we do. We're going to do this. I put it in video form. One minute and 20 seconds. And now I text them and I send them the video. So right behind it, it's like, hi, it's Richard from Seattle Life Coach Training. We'll be with you soon. Watch the video. Boom, boom, boom. And they're expecting it. That's another way of becoming visible and relevant. And people are responding now. So my point is that if it's not working, you got to figure it out, right? So one of the things I say is, what is relevance? Relevance is appropriate to the current time period or circumstances or contemporary in interest. So it's got to be relevant for today's people in the world. 
And the thing that I talk about is that we need to be willing to evolve. We need to learn new things. We need to try new things and we need to create and readjust. What happens with a lot of businesses is people get discouraged. They get discouraged because they, it's not happening fast enough. Did anyone relate to this? And they want it now and it takes time to prime the pump. So the component to this is that we've got to try new things and if it doesn't work, we have to go around it and try something else. And if that doesn't work, we have to try something else and then go around it and eventually one of those things are going to work. But you know what you're doing while you're doing all that? You're becoming visible. Mm -hmm. People are finding you. We went, and I know working in missions years ago, and I'm sure it's still the same, that when Sweeha gets leads for people like you to come into this school, I bet you, and tell me if I'm wrong, Mary, is it true 60 to 75% are word of mouth? Yes. It's was it was when I was in admissions in 203. Same thing with, what's that? Three out of four. Three out of four, so 75%. Why does that happen? Because people, this is your best advertisement. It's free. You don't have to sell them because they already know that you did an amazing work and they love you. And if you're amazing and you're doing this amazing work, I'm going to go to that school. There's no selling really hard involved in that because people are really in this place of getting that I know who you are. You're credible. I know people that did your classes. I do people that did your coaching sessions. I do people that got massages from you. I, whatever the deal is, you want that to be visible. Get out there and be visible. <laughs> the thing I tell people is that the best thing you can do is get out there and offer your services to people. Complimentary in the beginning and get them to love you. You got to get them to love you before you sell them something. So get out there and give them a piece, a taste, a mini session, a mini whatever, so they can get a piece of how amazing you are, and then they'll book you. Then they will hire you. But if you're not visible and you're sitting there, because I've said this to the students, you know what, guys? A website's not enough. A business card's not enough. You can have the best business card, you can have the best website, but if people can't find you in the World Wide Web, which how big is that? They're not going to find you. So get out there. One of the ways that we do that is gifts and graces tonight. There's people out there tonight that are all either students or graduates, and they want to show you their gifts. That's how you're going to get people to love you and to hire you and stay relevant, stay with the time, stay contemporary. So those are my seven keys to success of a soulful business. And that was a download from Spirit. So what I'd like you to do is I want to speak this to you. When I was writing this talk, or Spirit wrote this talk through me, what I thought the talk was about was about the seven other businesses that you're doing while running a business. So those seven things that we just talked about are the other business that you're in while running a business. So you get that? So it's not just about running a business. This is the other business that you're in. So you're in the business of being an expert. You're in the business of co-creating with your higher power. You're in a business of having great faith and practice. You're in the business of leading like-minded people. You're in the business of delegating to experts. You're in the business of being visible and relevant. That's your business beyond the business. It's the behind-the-scenes business that no one sees, the sweat on your brow. And thank you for being with us tonight and being available and being present and showing up physically. And I'd like to leave you with an invocation and a prayer for the soulful entrepreneur. And I want you, if you're willing, to just open yourself up. And you may even want to open your hands up because when you open your hands up, this is the universal sign of receiving. So just take in a nice deep breath and close your eyes.
and be willing to receive this on your behalf. We're going to bring in these seven success keys into your life and into your business so you may be successful and profitable and monetize your gifts and talents because the world's waiting for you. So as we take a breath, I know there is a power for good which is responding to me and bringing into my experience everything that is necessary for my enfoldment, to my happiness, to my peace, to my health, and to my success. I know there is a power for good that enables me to help others and to bless the whole world with a high level intention. So I say quietly to myself, there is one life, and that life is God. That life is perfect. That life is my life right now. It is flowing through me, circulating in me, and I am one with its rhythm. My heart beats with the pulsation of the universe in serenity, in peace, and in joy. The Divine Spirit animates my whole physical being. And if there is anything in it that does not belong, it is cast out now. Because there is one perfect life in me now. And I say to myself, I am guided daily so that I know and I shall know that what I do is perfect in every circumstance, in every situation. I am guided by divine intelligence through love, through joy, and a complete self-expression. Desiring that the law of good alone shall control me, I bless, I prosper everything I'm doing, I multiply every activity, I accept and expect happiness and complete success in every part of my life. And realizing that I am one with all people, I affirm that there is a silent power flowing through me all around me, which blesses, heals, prospers, and makes happy all that are on their righteous pathway. And realizing that the world is made up of people just like myself. And I pray daily to my higher power as I run my soulful business and I speak these words, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? And to whom? I bless the world and affirm that it shall manifest under the divine good, under divine love, and under divine intelligence. And we breathe it in knowing that it is so. For you, yes, you. And we visualize the perfect outcome, the perfect divine order and divine timing in all things. And yes, that includes you. And I ask you in this moment to take a deep breath and breathe it in, as done. And please repeat after me, all is well in all things. And that includes me. 
Amen. And so it is. Now as we sit in this space of neutral, opening ourselves up to the possibility of success in your businesses, I want you to repeat what's on the screen with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Where would you have me go? What would you have me do? And what would you have me say? And to whom? And I now release this into the law of your God as so, and so it is. Thank you.